I love you. You know that thunder and lightning was actually happening at 5 a.m. this morning. The it was first... happening in Sarasota too. Was it really? Yes, it sure was. How does that work? I don't know, but that was a big storm. I mean, we're up here and you're in Sarasota. An hour, an hour away. Now, yeah. how does that work? Storms move. <laughs> But, but it's amazing. So I, I asked Sharon, I said, did, did you hear that? And she goes, she had, apparently it was doing it way before 5 a.m. I don't know when it woke that. me up, but it woke me up. And, but I love storms. So I, I just got real cozy, pulled the blanket well, You better up love storms. You lived in Oklahoma. Yes. I mean, there are places in Oklahoma where if you have your home there, you have about a 50-50 chance of it being blown away. But remarkably, very few people ever die in Oklahoma from tornadoes. In Moore, Oklahoma, how many people died? Well, you got to remember. 70 or something? In, in terms of all the tornadoes that go through Oklahoma, very few of them are called killer tornadoes where anybody dies because Oklahoma is well prepared for it. The best thing you could do in Oklahoma when you build this new home have an underground bunker. Well, when I was growing up, almost all the homes had bunkers in the backyard. They had little green domes on them, but it was also, um, Castro supposedly had a nuclear bomb aimed at Midwest City, Oklahoma, where we lived. Seriously? Because Tinker Air Force Base was there. It wow. was the world's largest Air Force Base. And Castro supposedly had missiles aimed at us. So we were under the impression as children, we could survive this thing if the bomb hit. <laughs> And so everybody had bomb shelters. They were called bomb shelters back then. Now they're storm shelters. But most of my friends had them. In the, we had one in our backyard, and the big metal door would open up. You'd go down the steps, and there'd be little shelves <laughs> with your canned goods. I heard, I heard of one guy in Oklahoma, and I'm assuming it's true because, the, you know, anything on news is true, right? <laughs> but but he, he opened the thing to go down because the tornado was very close, and it was filled with people. Oh, yes, yes. It happened at our house and, and the one we had. Our neighbors got in it before we could. <laughs> yeah, because you don't lock them because yeah. you, you don't want to have to undo yeah. the lock yeah. while the storm's What, what is the combination? Yeah. So uh, yeah, they're open, but the door's heavy. Uh, yeah, that was a common experience when I was a kid going into each other's storm shelters. And, and Dave, just get, stay on Dave because I want to explain who he is. You know, we just started talking. Yes. This is, this is Dr. Dave and he's the guy that We'll be talking today about Proverbs. This is part 16. Yes, and we're all the way into chapter 20. 20. And how does what we just talked about have anything to do with Proverbs? Proverbs, if you apply them and live by them, they, you can avoid storms. Spiritual the, storms. The, the world winds that man creates in his own life, you can avoid if you live by Proverbs. Oh, you're so good at application. Have you ever... Have you ever preached? Because because you, you're you're not an application kind of guy. You 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 are in the word, period. Whereas you see a you know you see some preachers, they'll pick up a phrase like, uh, uh, you know, the fire, and they'll go. I mean, <laughs> they get the whole message is the fire, you know, and and everything that the fire. So so their their whole phrase is that. That was sort of the preaching I was raised on after I became a believer, a, a very simplistic, uh, and I'm not saying, I'm not dismissing it at all, but simplistic messages aimed at creating a response in the people who are listening. It's a hook. It's an effective way yeah. of communication. Yeah. Uh, but I could do that. It's not the way the Lord led me. Yeah. Well, you I, can't do that because you're, you're, your brain is whole Well, different. when I first started preaching, I did it because I can do it, but I don't get any sense of, I don't, I don't get a sense of well-being from it. I, it's better for me to what, let the Bible say what it has to say. What, what is deep and what is surface and what is topical? What are those phrases? Well, a topical message, a topical sermon is a, mess, a sermon that is about a topic primarily. And then you find the verses that can endorse whatever topic or enlighten the topic you're talking about. Contextual preaching is a message that you preach, well, here's the passage, and here's what this passage means based upon the context within uh, when it was delivered, to whom it was delivered, the context of the chapters around it. Uh, textual preaching tends to be you start in chapter 1 and you, go, you just go all the way through and you keep preaching 
um, in, a, in a serial of sermons. So you could have a year of the same subject. Yes. And uh, they all have their place. They're all, they're all good. Um, I just think we need more biblical teaching of the, of the content of the Word rather than just what we want it to say to somebody at that moment. And so shallow, deep, and surface, whatever, actually all those things have value uh, because on the surface is where all the turmoil is. As you go deep, yeah, that's what creates the energy up at the surface. So you need all of that. W was Billy Graham shallow? Billy Graham was simple but deep. Uh, he wasn't shallow because the gospel is not shallow. Billy Graham is, has been just simple in terms of that's what he preached on and he made it as clear as it could possibly be. Uh, but he wasn't a topical preacher and he didn't use cliches. Uh, Billy Graham preached the gospel every time, maybe in a different way, but it was always the gospel. And simple, to me, I try to be simple. I want to be deep, but I want it to be simple so that the people who are listening can understand. Not that I don't, I don't think they're smart, but I like things simple. How would a guy with your intellect ever think something was simple? <laughs> simple? Well, I, I like simple things. I, I enjoy simplicity. I think there's a, there's a genius to simplicity. You know, you've heard the phrase, brevity is the soul yeah. of wit. Yeah. There's, a, there's a certain genius to making something simple and easy to understand. And I, and I enjoy that when somebody does it for me, so I want to do it for others when what I can. What was a conversation in the Anderson family like? Because all of you guys are on another level intellectually. What was, what was that conversation like? I'd say like? most of our conversations went around, I don't think that's a word, and pull out the Scrabble dictionary because we played Scrabble so much. <laughs> and my mother's vocabulary was just ridiculous. And we were always challenging her words and she would always hope that we would challenge the word because in Scrabble, if you challenge the word and you're wrong, you lose your turn. So she would want us to challenge because she knew it was a word, but we'd never heard some of the words that she could spell. So we had a, we, it was a, a nightly ritual for our family to play Scrabble. Did you think everybody was, was like you guys? You know, I never gave it a thought. It just was our family life and my mom's love of games. We just played games all the time. And, and, uh, so what was it about Colleen in a conversation that just grabbed your heart? Uh, Colleen was very playful, uh, very fun, very uh, easy to engage in a conversation. And it was just, and she was beautiful. And it was, she was just pleasant to be around. And, you know, I, I uh, at Liberty, when I was in college, I, I, my educational circle was the preachers, but my fellowship circle were the football players. And I just liked, I enjoyed them more because- you were a star football player. Well, they were simple and real. Yeah. And sometimes I found those in the uh, spiritual disciplines just to be a, a, a bit, ostentatious, yeah. presumpt I don't know what the words would be, but I just enjoyed the regular guys on the football team more. Uh, and so I, I like simplicity, I like enjoyment, I, I like to smile. Is Proverbs in the, in the family of simplicity? Proverbs are very simple, but they're very profound. And they, they run deep, <laughs> but they're very simple because uh, it's analogies. Proverbs is, is it's one of the, the most uh, ancient ways of teaching Here's a this, here's a this, contrast and compare. And that's what Proverbs are. They're pairings or they're couplings of things that you can see that when you see them together, you, there's a truth that's revealed. When we, when we say inerrant Word of God, is that true here? Yes, of course. Even though through, through centuries of translation and, and, and different teachings and well, different it, it, individuals studied them and PhD studied them and a guy that with no PhD came up with his idea, we still come out with this. Well, it's the same thing as um, the terminology we use in technology. That if I said to you, um, um, ring me on my phone, give me a ring. I, that may have meant something back in the day when everybody had phones in their houses and the phone went ring, ring, give me a ring. Now, if I said it today, it, it wouldn't have the same uh, association but somebody would know what it meant. The truth would still be there. It means to contact me on yeah, the it's, phone. It's like when we used to do telethons, we'd say, folks, make the phone ring because we're trying to get people to give, yeah. which in essence 
no such thing happened. Right. The phones weren't ringing. Right. But, but people knew what it meant because yeah. the truth is the same. Same Agreed. thing is with these proverbs. They're 2,000, 3,000 years old, but the truth remains the same even if the analogy uh, might not hold true today because we don't have those same elements. Yeah. But the, the truth my, revealed is My the dad same. grew up in a family where they all drank and, and you know, I, I, I mean, I saw many of his brothers drunk. And, and this was, Dave, this was my dad's favorite verse. And this is, he, he literally taught me never to drink with this verse. Oh, through the verse he taught you that. He oh, didn't yeah. mean never drink while you're reading the verse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I love that. But seriously, uh, Proverbs 20, verse, does that say verse 1? Yeah. Verse 1. It's, it's one of the verses that got burned into my heart and mind. And really? Because I, I, I never, I don't drink either. Uh, wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. So... Um, there are many believers, and, and I can say I'm, I'm in that group now, that don't necessarily think drinking wine is a sin. Right. I think it's just unwise in terms of where it might lead. So to have a glass of wine with your dinner, nothing is wrong with that. But if you in, drink too much of any kind of alcoholic beverage, there's an alteration of your ability to inhibit your impulses yeah. or even your reaction times, which everybody knows it's wrong to drink and drive. So wine is a mocker, strong drunk is a brawler. You could say strong drink is an accident causer today. It's deadly, it's dangerous when you're driving. But to know that and then to do it anyway, he who does that is not wise. You can be led astray by these elements that alter your sense of perception. Uh, uh, so, this, so drinking is not a sin like adultery? No, I don't think it is. Okay. I, I don't, it, uh, but drunkenness would be. The Bible denounces drunkenness. Now, I still, I support those who, like me, don't want to drink at all because who knows if you can stop it. Yeah. Uh, why start something? If you know it leads somewhere bad, why start it? Yeah, I was, brought, I was brought up that, that if you drink, you just, you, you're not Christian. I mean, my dad drilled that into my, he'd take me down to Skid Row in Chicago and the drunks would lay on, literally lay in the street in this Skid Row area. And he goes, see, see that? I didn't realize what he was doing, but now I know he was teaching me. He says, see that? That's what happens to you when you drink. And then he would keep quoting this verse or whatever. And, 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 and so I remember in my, when I was in business in, in Buffalo, New York, flying to California, I think it was, to, to be with a whole bunch of executives, I saw one of Billy Graham's aides on the air, airplane, and I looked across at him, and he was having a glass of wine. I, I was devastated. This guy travels with Billy Graham? Does anybody know he drinks wine? Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that amazing how, yeah. and today I can see that and I go. No, there's some great benefits from drinking wine. You know, it, it's good for your cardiovascular yeah. system. It can calm you, help you sleep. There's some benefits, but with everything, just like there's benefits in eating, you can eat too much and cause great harm to your body. Same thing with drinking wine. But because wine or alcohol, because it, it alters your brain's functioning, to drink too much of it yeah. can lead you to unwise, shameful behavior. Wine, and that's the warning. Wine is a mocker. Yeah. So that's what you become. And, and or it's a mockery to your life. It, it'll bring mocking into your life because of the things that you'll do when you're drunk. Yeah. I've never been drunk. But I've heard yeah. plenty of stories of people who are. Oh, I've been drunk. And they do things that yeah. they don't even remember yeah, I know. That, that they did. Yeah. So it's just a warning yeah. from Solomon to the men. Stay away from it. And if you're going to drink yeah. it, you know, make sure you drink it with this in mind, yeah. that this can destroy your life yeah. if you cannot control it. Yeah, well, one of the, Max Liquato had a problem with drinking. He's one of the best authors. I mean, if you. Yeah, he, Max Liquato, yeah. Oh, he, yeah, I, I, I mean. And when I read, he had his whole story in one of his books, and I was just blown away. And I mean, he w he would stop like at a Seven Eleven, get a get a bottle before he went to his conference. Wow! In a brown bag. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, and, and finally one day, it's like he said, just the, the Holy Spirit says, "You can't do this." Right. Well, you remember Jack Hiles, and back in the uh, early '70s, there was a. Um, a reaction to how many extremely overweight preachers and gospel singers there were. 
they weren't drinking alcohol, but they sure were indulging yeah. in food way yeah. too much. And it was accepted. Yeah. That was that was the hypocrisy sure. that began people began to see. Very true. Well you you, you yeah. rail against yeah. people who drink, but you can you can eat way too much as a glutton yeah. and still uh, and and Jack Howes led that charge often and I thought very harshly and cruelly because you have to have some compassion. Not everybody who's overweight is a, is a glutton. And um, I used to be a member of his church. Oh, I know that, yeah. <laughs> I already preached one time and my pastor who led me to the Lord was a little heavy, wasn't. And uh, he preached a message at our church attacking preachers who are overweight. And I remember thinking, but this man led me to the Lord. I, I love this pastor. I love this man. Wow. Now, you know, we can be awful cruel to people yeah. uh, and judge their lives, but this is a warning yeah. not to judge people, but it's a warning to you. Watch what you allow into your body because it can destroy you. And wine, alcohol, Let's certainly. move on. We have about 12 minutes. Verse 3, it is honorable for a man to stop striving since any fool can start a quarrel. Wow. Now, this is a great verse for young men growing up who think exerting yourself, um, expressing yourself, standing up for yourself, uh, fighting it out to the end is, is manliness. It's, it's, um, it's masculinity. Uh, he says it's honorable for a man who can stop the striving, walk away from it. You don't have to win the argument. You don't have to win the fight. Oh, if we could remember that, and Dave. Any, any fool yeah. can start a quarrel. Yeah. And we see that illustrated all the yeah. time, how yeah. easy it yeah. is to start something. Yeah. But it takes a man of honor to stop it. It's like, it's like getting crazy when you're driving. Yes. And, and in our culture, and if you, you, you might not uh, expose yourself too much to modern music, but modern music promotes quarrel starting. Yeah. yeah. The modern culture, the heroes of the new culture are young men and women who go out there and cause, they're agitators. Yeah. Being an agitator is considered a virtue yeah. now. Yeah. And the Bible says any fool can do that. It takes yeah. no intelligence at all. Yeah. But it takes a man of wisdom to Let, stop a strike. Verse on. 4, the lazy man will not plow because of winter, but he will beg during harvest and have nothing. So, Well, you could, you could preach a message for an hour on that one. It's the short-sightedness of personal ease and comfort that allows you to so prioritize at this moment, I don't want to be discomforted, so I want to relax. And But a time comes when everybody else is reaping the harvest of what they did when you were relaxing, and you have nothing now. And you're and blaming now, the guy that has everything. And now you're begging. And now the guy who has everything is being selfish and not being <laughs> helpful. Yeah. But you had your opportunity, but because you prioritized uh, self-comfort. And that's what laziness really is. Yeah, yeah. Lazy people have high energy when it's something they want to do. It's got, because that still is about their comfort. Yeah. Uh, laziness is really a focus on, I want to be comfortable and I want to comfort my, my body. There's a lot of lazy men in prison. Uh, there's a lot of lazy men and women all over the place, yeah. yeah. Um, because they take the easiest way yeah, out. Yeah. But a uh, laziness is a, is a, um, it's short-sightedness is what it is. It's not seeing that what I do today is what I'll reap later. Exactly. They don't fact, they, it's, it's what I want now. That's really the root of what yeah. laziness is. Um, number six, verse six. Most men will proclaim each his own goodness, but who can find a faithful man? Now this has a, this has a double application. Boy, there's a lot of women out there that will agree with that one. But <laughs> who can find a faithful man? Well, this is a, uh, an interesting way to look at it. There's two ways to look at this verse. Men have a tendency. Now, me, this doesn't mean just males. It me, men is a mankind. Yeah. Most people will proclaim their own goodness. They will talk about themselves. They'll give themselves the benefit of the doubt. They will um, uh, extol their own virtues. But then that next phrase, who can find a faithful man? That might mean, is there anybody who really is good? That's one way to say it. Like everybody says they're good, but can you find a good person? Or it can say, everybody talks about their own goodness, but can they find anybody who measures up to that? Can well, they, that they is, never find anybody. That's good. discernment. Yeah. Because when, you, when you're talking about yourself all the time and always presenting yourself and your goodness, you don't see the goodness in others. Would you know you're like that if you were like that? I don't think so. I think you're oblivious to it. Um, then how do you ever get past it? How do you ever improve? Somebody 
has enough impact in your life has to confront you with it and tell you to stop doing it because you're not aware you're doing it because when you're proclaiming your own goodness you're automatically having to fudge the truth you're having to to add to the details you're having to exaggerate it, which all those things are lies and we don't call them lies you know we call it poetic license or or just adding to the story exaggerating but beca- but it's a deception in your mind so you take a, an event that you were in and you add to it and you build it to make yourself look better well after a while you lose what truth really is well you're right so you can't analyze yeah. anymore and then you become unfaithful and then nobody measures up to this false yeah. standard yeah. that you've presented yourself to be yeah and it's a uh, it's a uh, i think everybody has that tendency but some people are are they're immersed in it, and that they don't even realize they are doing that. Uh, verse 9, who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin. And it's a reminder to all of us to remain humble. And, and basically it said, who can say it, it means nobody can say that. Yes, pretty much saying it. nobody can say that. Because in some way, you've cleaned it out, you've made progress, but it's like cleaning out a garage. You can always keep cleaning. Your, your heart is never totally clean or pure from sin in your daily experience. You are clean from any sin that pollutes your righteousness before God. Yeah. But in your daily life, after you're a believer, that's why um, John writes, if you say you have not sinned, you, you are lying. The truth is not in you. If we confess our sin, where f- God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. He wrote that to Christians. This wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a statement to the unsaved world. It was an epistle to a church. So he's telling us, believers, once you've been saved from your sin and you're going to heaven, you're right before God, sin still creeps into your daily practical life. That must be confessed so that your fellowship with God remains strong because the relationship is secure. It's, that's permanent. But the fellowship with God wavers. Boy, that's a great point. Based upon what you just said there. Say that again. That- I'm not sure which one, but... Your, 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 your fellowship. Yeah. Your, when, when you confess your sin as a believer, yeah. you're restoring or you're allowing God to restore your fellowship yeah. with Him that is affected by your sin. But your relationship is never that's affected. What, that's what we need to understand. Yeah. The relationship is always there. Yes. Well, I have a daughter and a son. They are my daughter, Brooke, my son, David. My relationship to them is permanent no matter what they ever do. But my fellowship with them can be affected by how they behave or by how I behave. See, that's a truth we need to marry. Yes, yeah. and, and therefore, we're always checking our heart. Yeah. Every single day, we should be confessing to God our frailties and our failures, whether it's moral or, uh, or ethical or philosophical, whatever, because it humbles us yeah. to know I'm not perfect. Oh, yeah. So when you realize your heart's not clean, you're not pure from sin, it makes you less uh, prone to point fingers at other people. Yes. You want to say, hey, we all have our problems and let me work on myself. And doesn't it make you feel better when you see somebody you had on a pedestal and they drop a few notches and you go, wow. It, it, it go, wow. Because <laughs> I figured I was the biggest sinner on the planet until you see that. So, so it almost like it doesn't give you license to do what they did, but it's like, wow. Oh, no, I understand what you're saying. I, I, my feeling when I see somebody like that fall I, I, I feel uh, hurt for them and yeah. their family. Yeah. It's like, oh, I, another one. Uh, because I, I see as all of us, as you, as you see yourself, I'm sure, that if, if all the things that could come out about us did, we'd be in that same spot. Except for the grace of God. Yeah, and, and yeah. so you, you, you're, you're, you're grateful for God's grace that the failures yeah. in your life have remained in the shadows yeah. and you feel bad for them. Yeah. Uh, but I, I know from experience now, every, no matter who the preacher or singer, whatever it is, uh, we all stand in a reputation yeah. that God has allowed us to have yeah. because who can say we wow. have a clean heart and we're pure from we sin? We have four minutes, less, less than. than. Diverse weights and diverse measures, they are both alike, an abomination to the Lord. Now this is simply a, a denouncement of dishonest business yeah. dealings, yeah. which had to do with money changing or bartering where you would change uh, you get this cow for this bag of yeah. silver, but the weight that scaled it was tipped. Finger on the scale. Yeah. So false business, being unethical, not yeah. having integrity in the way you, the way you deal with people. The Bible says it's an abomination. God hates it, and that's why we forget God is 
is, um, is he is truth. He doesn't just love truth. The Bible says Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. God is truth. So he treasures truth. Yeah. He values truth. As, as preachers and teachers of the Bible, we must be true in what we're saying yes. or we become like a false weight and a false measure before God. Yeah. And even though the outcome might look good, because you know what happens when somebody has false weights? They make money. They prosper. Big time. But it's an abomination to God. Yeah. Ministries can prosper yeah. with false weights and false balances. That's why I brought up the agenda. They, they have an agenda, which is a false weight. Yeah, and, and I have to say, you know, as a, as a pastor, I have to constantly remind myself, I don't look at the outcome and the result. Yeah. Look at the content of the message. Boy. Is it true to the Word of yeah. God? Because it's a tendency yeah. to want to say things that motivate people. Yeah. And sometimes, as one Bible teacher told me, you know, a uh, really good Bible study can destroy good preaching. Yeah. Um, because you realize, I can't say that. That's it's right. Not really and because nobody's going to hear it. Yeah. yeah. But if you say, God says, yeah. you can say anything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But if you read the Bible. One more good verse. Verse 13. Do not sleep, lest you come to part. Do not love sleep lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes and you'll be satisfied with bread. It's just another reminder to not assume that somebody else is responsible for your welfare, but to open your eyes and do your work so that you might reap the benefit of your labor. And for each one of us in our lives, the Bible expects us, God expects us to live for Him. Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, um, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God, which is reasonable service. He expects me to do it. He expects you to do it. As believers, we are to open our eyes, not love the leisure and the comfort that even the Christian life provides, but give our lives to God and serve Him that we might reap the benefits. That's why Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither rust nor moth corrupts. Don't lay them up here on earth. We all are to be responsible for our own spiritual investment in eternity. Not to gain eternity, that's given to us. But the rewards and treasures we'll have in heaven are directly related to what we're doing right now. So even though we tend to, we tend to gravitate towards ease and comfort, God wants us to serve Him faithfully because Jesus served us faithfully. He came to serve us and win us, and He did so by dying on the cross. He gave His life for us. He tells us to give our lives back to Him. So again, we just follow His example and live diligently for the Lord. Isn't it great to know that we can speak about this publicly on national television? What a blessing. Pray for us. God bless you. Bye-bye.